Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode seven of Kotaku's Split Screen. I am your host, Jason Schreier, and over there, somewhere far away, is my co-host, Kirk Hamilton. Hi, Kirk. Hi, Jason. I'm not that far away. Like, like just a whole nation away. Across the country, far, far away, in sunny Portland. Uh, is it warm over there for you guys? No, it's not. It's not sunny. It's been cold and rainy for a week, which is actually kind of nice because it's been too sunny here lately, but uh, not exactly sunny Portland this time of year. In cold, dark, horrible Portland, there you where go. it gets dark at 4.30 because of farmers who ruin everything. <laughs> and uh, today we have a very special guest, uh, our good friend. Uh, he is a writer. He writes about video games. He is a scholar. He's a former game developer. He worked for companies like Activision, Bungie, 343, and some, some tiny little games called Call of Duty and Halo and Destiny. And... Uh, <laughs> Right now, he works at the University of Washington in uh, a research lab called the Center for Game Science, Uh, and I think he's most famously known as the man who reviewed sex, Uh, (laughs) the one and only Matthew Burns. Hi, Matthew. Hello. How are you doing today, Matthew? I'm doing pretty good. It It is rainy and cold up here in Seattle, but it's nice. I like it. Yeah, it's nice, right? I feel like when the Pacific Northwest gets sunny for too long everyone goes a little crazy so it's it's nice when it uh gets cold and rainy like it's supposed to be that's right the natural (laughs) so everyone goes crazy when it when it's too sunny it gets a little weird yeah like we're i think people up here are used i mean i haven't lived in portland that long but i think everyone's kind of used to it being wretched i mean you've lived in seattle longer than i've lived in portland matthew but i yeah i'm there's something to this right yeah i used to live in la before seattle and you just get used to it. You just get used to it being sunny all the time. And in Seattle, when the sun is out for too long, it just feels like the sun is beating down on you and punishing you. And you want the clouds yeah. to come back. Yeah, it, it, feel, it feels different. Yeah, it feels different. You don't in Seattle. trust it. You can't trust the sun. You can. You got to be like, oh, there's a catch here. Like it's too nice out. This is a problem. <laughs> well, and there yeah. is a catch, right? Because like our planet is slowly turning into like a molten ball of lava or whatever. So that's the catch. <laughs> it's like underlying everything is we're all doomed. <laughs> that's yeah. Well, I mean, move to New York if you want to be like feel an underlying sense that everything's doomed at all time. <laughs> um. But so, so, okay, so we have a lot to talk about. A lot of stuff has been going on this week in the world of video games, and we will get to some of those interesting topics. Um, so, so one of the first things, one of the funniest things that happened this week is uh, a company called Epic Games that a lot of people have heard of. They're the folks who made Gears of War and Unreal Tournament and the Unreal Engine. They announced a game. I mean, maybe a game. At least we think it's a game. It's probably a game, yeah. Probably a video game uh, called Paragon. Uh, that was their first mistake, calling it Paragon. First of all, yeah, it's such a like it's just the name already is really good because, you know, I feel like Paragons are in a lot of other games already. <laughs> it's it's yeah. I mean, so a Paragon is like like when I think of a Paragon, I think of like this quintessential like ideal person right or something like that mm-hmm. is that what a, that's what a paragon is right like a, an ideal person yeah, yeah. or the blue the hero. blue choice in mass effect or a, a, <laughs> a dwarf in dragon age who has been elevated to like nobility status right isn't that also what a paragon is <laughs> well it's unique because like when you think of a video game you never think of like an ideal hero person uh so it's good to finally get a video game <laughs> to play as a hero right right um, and so the press release for Paragon, I just brought it up here. Yeah, I'm it reading says, it too. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it out loud because it's short and it's really funny. It says, the email I got is, Hi, Jason. Hope you are doing well. Dropping you a note to let you know that Epic Games just announced, launched the teaser site for its new game, Paragon, which is coming to PC in early 2016. We'll have more news in the coming weeks. <laughs> Learn more at playparagon.com. To accompany today's news, the team has released a teaser video of Twin Blast, an in-game playable <laughs> hero in Paragon. You can also download the game's logo here. <laughs> First of all, the logo <laughs> thing is good. The logo. I like that it in, ends with the logo. Game? It's like... Check out this logo. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes, sometimes you just gotta download the logo and uh, right. I don't know, put it on your Twitter. Did they really call him an in-game playable hero? 
Right. Well, and then if you go to the website on the bottom left uh, of the hero trailer thing, it says, this is an actual in-game playable hero. <laughs> what other kind of playable hero would there be? Like, I don't right. know. Uh, the out of the, the ARG kind, yeah. maybe like this is this is just a character in the meta fiction. This is like a, a grimoire card kind of video. But he's playable, <laughs> right? Doesn't playable, playable c- c- kind of oh, covers the in game part, right? Like, yeah, it's a little redundant. This is a, a small point to to fixate on in this announcement, but actually, a, 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 no, 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 a valid <laughs> one. <laughs> Um, so, so it's all they say is that it's a new game. They don't say what it is, except that it's coming to PC. Then you go to the Twitter feed, and the Twitter feed is Play Paragon, um, and it has one tweet. It says, <laughs> "Victory is earned. Join the fight. Welcome to Paragon. <laughs> <laughs> Victory is earned. So that, Join the fight." So we know a lot from that tweet. I feel like I learned a lot anyway. We right. know that victory is not just given to you. You don't just win. <laughs> You're, it's not free. You, you have, have to, to earn meet it. a certain set of conditions. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Not clear what those conditions are, but you do need to no. earn victory. Never. No. You know. You got to find out what those conditions so are. So we know those, there is a fight mysteries. currently happening. You're there not going fight. to begin a fight. You're going to join a fight that is in progress. So mm. also a new thing that we've learned. Mm. And we're going to join Paragon. Paragon right, is apparently you, an organization, or maybe just It feels just very the game. inviting. <laughs> right. <They're, laughs> so. Maybe they're fighting an organization called, like, the Renegade Organization. Oh, that would be so Renegade. good. Paragon versus maybe, Oh, my God. Maybe it's like, okay, I just watched the movie Inside Out, which, side note, is, like, the best movie I've ever seen. That movie, it's about, like, emotions inside a person's head, right? And how they, like, work out accords. Maybe what this game is, is it's, ma- it's like a meta Mass Effect game where you play as the Paragon side of Commander Shepard inside of Commander Shepard's brain. And then the other team, they're playing the <laughs> Renegade side. So you are fighting and whoever wins like decides whether like Commander Shepard throws someone down an elevator shaft or is nice to them. So you're kind of playing inside of the moral choices of Mass Effect. How about that? <laughs> Kirk, this is a way, way better idea for a game than Paragon actually is. That would so. be so good. I would play that. Maybe it's what it is. We can hold out hope because we don't know. No, it's because true. you look at the Paragon website and it's like, here are a bunch of heroes and items and this is a fucking <laughs> team hero shooter MOBA, whatever. Um, which is like, there are way too many of those now with Overwatch and this and Battleborn and Battlecry and whatever the fuck Warface else. and Warbreath and, yeah. <laughs> Warbreath <laughs> and Hellzone and Hellzone. Hero, <laughs> hero Kill. <laughs> ba- Warfeet. Um, I just mix Battle, Kill, Zone, hero, any of those names. And so, face. Don't over. Forget face. one question I have about this is Is this actually an effective marketing campaign? Because they did get a lengthy Kotaku post out of this. No, because we're never going to talk about it again because nobody's ever going to care about this game. Mm. You I feel to, like that's, <laughs> that's really sad. It's I really mean, sad. I, I can't argue with that based on what I've seen so far. It could be amazing, but yeah, uh, I yeah, it doesn't look. And promising. I feel bad. And, and uh, Matt, maybe you, Matthew, maybe you can speak to this a little bit. But I always feel bad for the developers who are stuck on a game that they know nobody's going to really care about. Like, have you ever been in that situation, or well, knew anyone who's in that situation? I mean, it could be a really good game, but like all of the the marketing activity is just sounds really rote. Like they're just kind mm. of going through the motions. Like, oh will reveal the new character but you can already guess what all the characters are right there's going to be like the the more tanky guy and then there's going to be the more agile per- it's like you can you can just see from from the stuff that they've announced already that it's like you can kind of imagine what the game already is so there's no real mystery or anything like that right it kind so of think... announces itself right like <laughs> yeah you, you yeah, can you're like, like oh, oh there'll okay. be a girl and she like moves quickly and like wears a cool cat suit and has a sniper rifle like you can just kind of Sort of assume these things. Yeah, of there's course, nothing surprising. Uh, there's plenty about. to be announced about Twin Blast. You don't want to know more. About... <laughs> he has two guns, and he's called Twin Blast. I feel like I know everything there is to know. But like, so like games like this, yes, you totally fair. It could be awesome. It could be the best thing ever. Like totally blow Overwatch out of the water. But with a game like this, uh, even if it's good, it's kind of it feels like it's being sent to die. Like same as Battleborn by Gearbox, which feels like it's going to come out and like Whiff and uh, a lot of smaller games that are like like uh, came out 
probably in like the THQ era when more people were making games that are, were like double A games that not a lot of people cared about. Um, so I always, I'm always curious about what it's like to actually work on those games. And I feel bad for people who are stuck in that position and like having to see everyone either shitting all over the marketing campaign as we are now or just not caring at all, which is probably even worse. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think some of the games that I worked on, like when I when I used to work at Activision back in the day, were marketed in a pretty perfunctory way. But I don't know. I think Activision is actually pretty pretty good at marketing. Like they they know what people want to hear, and mm -hmm. um, they they're pretty good about getting people to to hear those things. Probably not um, applicable to this in in this situation, but it just feels you know. As a developer, you're not always 100% like thinking about your marketing campaign that's really someone else, and you just want to uh, make sure that your game itself is is really good. And you might you know you might go on a website and look at some articles about your game and, and hope that people are excited for what you're working on. And then you get to Kotaku and you see us shitting all over. <laughs> yes, Kotaku. <laughs> sometimes that sometimes that really sucks. Yes, like some like I worked on um, I worked on Call of Duty Three which was this weird like game that came out after the first Modern Warfare. And so it was like the message of the game was we're going back to World War II and we're going we're going back to Treyarch from Infinity Ward and the message the messaging was really weird about that and a bunch of people like heard about it on the internet and got all mad. And so Wait, was not Modern Warfare Call of Duty 4? It was I think wait a minute. It was call it wait. It was World at War that came out after Modern Warfare. Or I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm unless sorry. I'm crazy. Yes. Yeah. No, I'm confusing. Get them. your You're game right. straight, Burns. I don't on. remember. You made too many video <laughs> games. These Call man. of Duties. Yeah. There's like you a said million that, I was of these like, really? Call of Duties. That seems crazy. You're right. No, it was World at War. Yeah, and it was like we're going back to World War Two, and it was because Treyarch had started on that game um, right after Call of Duty Three, and Modern Warfare right. came out like in the in the year in between. Sorry, gotcha. I completely confused my Call of Duty like timeline. But it's it's oh, kind well. of funny. It's <laughs> kind of can't, funny can't, because it's can't like mess up that those military shooters. Got to remember, <laughs> right? That yeah. it would be that it would be this like well, the World War II game or the other World War II game. They're kind of similar. Um, that was funny when they announced World of War. I remember it was there was a big deal because Kiefer was in the game, right? This is the the first time maybe that Kiefer had been billed as as being a big deal in a game because he was the main character in that game. And they said, oh, it's going to be great. Four-player co-op. It's going to be really good. And then people weren't really very psyched that it was World War II. I, yeah. I would play anything with Kiefer Sutherland, in fairness. True. Gary, Old, Gary Oldman's in it, too. That's right. He's like he's in a lot of he's those He's a games, Russian. Huh? Yeah, he plays a Russian commissar. Did you work with those guys in the, in the sound booth? Um, no, because I, I was not at Treyarch by the time that game was like coming out he like uh, gary involved. oldman is kind of in in all of those games isn't he or he's in all the Treyarch games am i i don't know I he's in a lot of stuff yeah, this correctly? He, i think he just he i mean he likes game work some actors don't some actors don't want to work on games and gary mm -hmm. oldman likes i think he he actually enjoys it so yeah he went to kind of stealing the show stuff. in some of those in, in some of those older games when he's playing the like russian commandant guy he uh he, he like he doesn't phone it in he really goes for it which is always kind of cool Mm. Yeah. Well, so so okay. So back to Paragon for a second. So we all looked at Paragon and we were like, "Wow, this is some some bad video game marketing," um, which made me think, "What is what was the worst video game marketing or the worst video game announcement of all time?" Because there was tons. I mean, back in the day, we had magazines with like half naked chicks, like saying like and captions saying <laughs> sexually suggestive things, and like like <laughs> lots of stuff that would appeal to teenage boys. But I don't know. I was trying to think out of the box a little bit. And and Matthew, you had you had a funny story, right? You remember yeah, one in so particular. Yeah. So on on that note, I mean, so as a marketer, marketers try to think about what makes your game unique. And so you were talking about the worst video game marketing. Uh, and the worst video game marketing story I can remember is from E3 2003, so like 12 years ago. <laughs> so uh, now, yeah, a long if, time ago. Yeah, it was, a, it was a while back. If you guys remember, there was a company called Tecmo, and mm. they were <laughs> launching a game for the Xbox called Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball. So if you think about like what the, what the marketing sell of this game is, they went with it and ran with it and they they hired these models to um, try to come into the E3 show booth and like 
do some sort of show or something like that, wearing bikinis. <laughs> and so many people came to their booth that the fire marshal came and shut down the show and said it's a fire hazard because too many people <laughs> are standing around. And so then um, they started arguing with the with the show, like E three the E three show itself, about whether they should go ahead with this or not or keep doing it. And eventually things came to a head and E three cut the power to their booth. So they couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> really? Wow. It was ridiculous. And then after all of that, they put out a press release bragging that they had that they had done that, that they were like too hot for E three or whatever. That's kind of badass. <laughs> Actually that's kind of I mean the whole that's kind of funny that they would wind up turning trying to turn the whole thing into a win when really it's sort of a like sort of a bad look from top yeah. to bottom it was probably i mean it's like they they started digging themselves a grave and they just kept going like they just went farther and farther into this like horrible hole of like awfulness. do you think a company could get away with that today in the age of twitter no, I don't. I don't think so, or I would hope not. I mean, like, I I don't think that like the the mainstream game industry is is necessarily the place for that kind of thing. I think that like, if you're going to make some sort of game that's that's like on that kind of subject matter, there's maybe that's more of like a subculture thing. I don't know. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I mean, it's it's sort of a sign of how much E3 has changed. Like the whole like that's like beyond booth babes even but it's that same kind of a thing of let's get a bunch of hot chicks at our booth and that'll attract a bunch of these gamers and you know that mentality has is definitely on the wane and has been for a while so but that was you know it was long enough ago that it sounds like that sort of thing was just yeah hell yeah we'll get some girls in bikinis and we'll get a million people here and we'll shut the whole thing down this is gonna be awesome (laughs) shut it down yeah yeah um, did that game sell well? Was it like an effective? Was, did it wind up being an effective marketing technique, or did it oh, just make I it that stupid? Game. Yeah, I have no idea how it sold. Actually, all like the if dead or alive well. games sell sell to people who enjoy wating uh, anime boobs jiggling. That's right. There's how many, a, yeah, but how many people is that. that? Is that a lot of people, or is that like ten people? You know, is that like a, it's a huge lot. Well, market? It has, I'm, it? I'm looking, and it has a nine point two amazing rating from IGN. So. Well, there they you go. say they liked it. From 2003, IGN. Was, yes. IGN was a way different place in 2003. Wait, I'm going to look at the end of this review. Oh, this is a long review. I'm, I'm skipping to the end to see hey, what the verdict well, the says. Hey, the people have to know what the gameplay and the story and the replayability and all the... Got to hit all the beats for, for your... Okay. <laughs> the, the verdict review says... DOAX is particularly difficult to review because it delivers on its promise of controllable near-naked models, even though controllable near-naked models isn't what the game should be about. <laughs> so it, What? It says, the volleyball begins as an afterthought to the girls, but really ends up being the greatest strength of the game. The fact that every character in the game is showing off plenty of flesh never becomes irrelevant even when I was locked in a close match where every bump, set, and spike was crucial. So basically, they say it's a pretty good sense. volleyball game, and it has attractive, nearly naked women in it. So that's that's the verdict, which I think that we probably could have guessed. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Nine point two. Nine point two, amazing. <laughs> Do you think they had like a lot of internal discussion, like eight hours of debate over whether it was a nine point two or a nine point one? They're like, look, that yeah, extra 9.3. point one, it just it just doesn't uh, it just doesn't quite earn it. <laughs> so, what are some other like awful awful video game marketing stories? I remember there was a a bomb threat. Was it last year or like a bomb squad was called in because because uh, of a Watchdogs PR stunt or something like that? Oh, uh, it was in Australia. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. What was the story there? It was like billboards or something, right? Or what were they doing? Um, so the story was that uh, like a Watchdog Ubisoft's PR people in Australia sent uh, promotional material that I guess it was a safe, a beeping safe sent to an outlet in oh, man. Australia. <laughs> Why would you do that? That sounds like such an like, awful it's idea. The ma- it's like, always the mail that gets them in trouble. So what and happens? It was, and so they had to call the the bomb squad. They had to call the police. Four police cars and a police <laughs> rescue unit. Uh, <laughs> and they found a copy of Watch Dogs. You think about it, like, in our current <laughs> in our current sort of weird internet climate, like, if at Kotaku a box showed up that was beeping, you guys would probably call the cops, too. I would. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, man. We would be like, man, this is Gamergate. 
gamer gets finally <laughs> <coming together. laughs> finally gotten serious the um and then it was mafia right the one i always think of is mafia doing a similar deal i think it was mafia one or mafia two i can't remember where they mailed brass knuckles to everybody or to <laughs> press and they were oh like, and they were illegal right they yeah, were actually and it turns out that's like territories. an illegal weapon or weapon in some states and they were mailing them across state lines so they were i think technically you may be committing a federal crime i'm not sure about that but the whole thing was a mess it was like i think included with review copies or something like also here are some actual brass knuckles <laughs> why would you do yeah. that i just don't what understand like what why that's like good marketing to do that to send weapons and, and bombs and things in the mail like sometimes you just gotta commit a couple of felonies to sell your game Especially mm-hmm. if it's a game about crime, you know, you want to get people in the mindset before they review it. Like, here, now you're a criminal, now review the game about criminals. Also, hey, we're remembering this stuff, so I guess in, in some ways it worked. It's That's true. true. I remember yeah. that more than I remember anything about Mafia 2 other yeah. than that, so <laughs> I guess that's and good. Like, like, I'll always remember that old Daikatana ad that was like, John Romero is yep, going to yep. make you his bitch. Like, that's iconic it's burned into my memory so in some ways it worked even if the game was terrible i mean and we still joke about warface the worst named game of all time we still make warface jokes like warface became a cultural touchstone just by having a terrible <laughs> name that everybody made jokes about and I but they really warface did became a cultural touchstone <laughs> no but they yeah, did i, I mean, feel look. like it was like at least a running joke between us and like rock paper shotgun and people on twitter there was people still joke about warface even now do you think that your That's twitter feed is the source of cultural touchstones i mean a minor cultural touchstone at least insofar as like two major gaming publications and a lot of people making the same joke sure i mean it's not a cultural touchstone like r2d2 when i think of culture i think of star wars lord of the rings Warface. yeah exactly right those things are all kind of kind of on the same level which i'm sure was their goal parts of american culture Uh, well Warface isn't even american so it's uh it's a german it's global it's global so it's, they figured uh, it out. They figured out the the marketing secret sauce. <laughs> they cracked the code. <laughs> no, I do I wonder though if that. someone ever says this is so dumb that Kotaku just might run a post about it. <laughs> like if that's sort of where they go with this stuff, or if it really is just totally going through the motions, uh, well, like it kind of seems to be with Paragon. Happened. I bet that's what happened with that Dead Island torso thing. I bet that was like, we know we're going to get some outrage bloggers, so we got to send this out. Do you guys mm-hmm. remember that? For, oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> do yeah. I remember that? Island, that right? God, Am I remembering that right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was the first Dead Island, right? And they right. just well, yeah, yeah, and it was like a severed female torso. That they yeah, so, <laughs> sometimes when you're really like deeply working on a game and just thinking about the game, you don't you forget to think about how things look in context in the real world because you're just thinking about your game. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, you know, yeah, and I think sometimes that leads to honestly bullshit on our side. Like I, I was always bummed out by the there was a big debate over the Far Cry. At which one far cry 4 cover and how it, it appeared to show like a white guy with his hand on the head of a like native person and everybody kind of got very up in arms about it and there were think pieces written about it and i remember just thinking okay we don't know anything about this guy we don't know what's going on in this picture it turned out there was some explanation which whatever um made the whole thing make sense in context but i remember thinking this isn't the thing that i would be expending my critical energies on mm. anyway yeah there's a lot to be said about about outrage culture and how uh how it's how it affects us and impacts us and impacts video games as all well. but that's uh, that's a separate, separate conversation oh and i mean and of course there are things that are like worth getting getting up in arms about it i just yeah, remember it was the kind of thing where they put out that i bet you the people working on that game they had written this whole story about this guy and like the weird dude who like had a weird thing with his mom and he left the country and came back and they were thinking about all this stuff and they're like and here's our cool cover and then suddenly everyone's angry about it and i'm guessing that everyone who made that game just wouldn't it never would have occurred to them uh, yeah, it's hard to think about they were how so things look. It. Um, it's, it's hard to think about how things look from from like outside, especially when you've been working on something and thinking about it for a long time. Like this kind of reminds me of a, a random story of when I was at Bungie. Uh, we had these like replica weapons of like some of the Halo weapons, so like the sniper rifle and the battle rifle and stuff. And uh, it turns out we had to be really careful taking them outside and like walking around with them 
because <laughs> a couple times people like actually called the cops and stuff and said <laughs> people are walking around downtown Kirkland with like weapons and stuff. And to us, they're so clearly like halo weapons, which don't look anything like real life weapons. Um, and they're, they were also like scaled up larger than a real weapon would be. I mean, they looked <laughs> so it's some guy with to like us, a, right? a huge sniper rifle that looks like the size of a car, but people see it. Right. And think, yeah, oh, God. exactly. It was just, well from a distance or like if you'd never, yeah, yeah, it. like no. it's just the context. Right. And just like running our, you know, running around Kirkland, which is a kind of a, <laughs> a, an affluent suburb of, of Seattle, like people were shocked, I guess, or concerned, expressed some concern about it. So wait, and were you ever there when they called the cops? No, I, it didn't. It didn't happen to me. No, it was oh, okay. it was other people. <laughs> but uh, so you just have happened? to be. Did the cops come and, and they, they just, have to be like, yeah, and you just have to be like, oh, these are these are props. Like we make we make games, and this is not real. <laughs> they're more. Oh, they're man. way more used to that in in Los Angeles than they are in in Seattle, right? Because in L.A., like you can just go to the prop right. house and and get like World War II weapons, which we did. Like we rented. World War Two weapons from from like this, these big prop houses, and and did stuff. With so them. when you rent those weapons, do you have to like sign a waiver that says like if I get shot, waving this around in public, <laughs> it's on me. Um, there's different <laughs> levels of weapons that they have. Most of them are don't don't actually work. If you want to get the ones that that fire that actually fire blanks or, or fire fire, then you have to have all this paperwork and you have to have an expert with you and all this other stuff but you can rent uh, just okay. a, like one that that's been fused to where the metal's been fused so it can't fire anything you can get those fairly fairly easily that's crazy because i mean that would definitely be enough to get you shot by a cop if you pulled it out i mean those guns they're real guns right that's what you're saying but they've just been kind of rendered. yeah they're real world war ii era guns so yeah you do have to be aware of like you can't just like I mean, if you are in full, like, World War II uniform and running around with it, and there's, like, people with cameras and stuff, like, I feel like it's a little bit Right, 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 right. I mean, more like while you're walking yeah. to the studio, like, and you're carrying it. Oh, you put, you put, them, really in a, realize. put them in a bag. Yeah, put them in a black duffel bag or right, something. Right, right. It seems smarter. <laughs> don't don't well, just, like, walk. What if you're running around in full uniform and the cops think you're a time traveler? Oh, who man. Was sent back to, or was sent forward to... Uh, to to attack them and start or, World War Three, or maybe to warn them of something important, so maybe they would right. stop and listen to you. Uh, Kurt, how how would they warn? Like if someone's coming from the past, I don't think they, I'm they can think. warn us. World oh, War Two. Oh, World, no, War World War Two. Happened. Wait, yeah, wait. Why, World War why, why would happen, you travel guys? from the past to the future? Oh, well, to I'm like save you. your kids. To check I'm trying out to the think future. why they did it in Back to the Future too. <laughs> it was their kids. <laughs> That's right. Okay, you go to the past to warn people. <laughs> yeah, you go um, to the future to just see what the future is like. So right, Matthew, right, to, is, right that, it, is that what? Yeah. So when you are in the lab at the University of Washington, do you dissect video game weapons? Is that what you guys do? There? No, no, we don't. We don't do that at all, actually. So um, what do you, what do you guys do? So our two kind of major research areas here at the university are um, studying educational games. So for like for math and science, um, have kids play games that are educational and see if see if kids learn better or retain more than just being taught by normal methods. And then um, scientific discovery games, which is sort of mapping like a real scientific domain onto a game. And so by playing the game and by getting really good at the game, you can actually contribute to real science. Um, and our game Fold It is an example of that. You, you start it up and you can actually manipulate the structure of proteins in the game. And then that those solutions that you create are evaluated by real scientists and they're like oh that's a really good fold like that probably does exist in real life and so you can contribute to science by playing this playing this game wow so you so you have so someone picks up this game they start folding proteins just randomly or do they have to have some level of scientific knowledge to be able to do this you don't have to have any prior scientific knowledge but you do have to get good at the game and it is a fairly steep learning curve like you can't just pick it up and suddenly like you're folding proteins really amazingly well. Um, so you have to stick to it. There's tutorials in the game and stuff like that. But so like, is this like a, I, I haven't played it. I admit I haven't played it, but is this like a space chem kind of a deal? Like with that same sort of a, an approach? Or sort of, any yeah. It's, it's, it's a little bit similar to space chem and then it's open-ended and there's a, a huge like possibility space of like lots of different configurations because it's real science. Mm -hmm. So there's not like, there's not like we have a solution in mind that you're going for. It's like, here are, molecules that you can just kind of arrange any way you want to and there's a little bit of feedback on like what 
the program thinks is a better molecule or what is a worse molecule, and then you submit it. So can you give us some examples of stuff that that has come out of Foldit? Like scientific discoveries or, or interesting uh, interesting finds? Worm, in wormholes, maybe parallel dimensions, something like that? <laughs> yeah, I wish. That Time would be travel. really cool. Um, a few years ago, the, the players actually were able to solve the structure of a, um, oh, I forget the complete name, but it's the Mason Pfizer monkey virus retroviral, retroviral protease. There you go. Huh. Um, which is a, a protein that is involved with, with AIDS, actually. And um, you, by predicting the structure of the protein, players were actually able to, to solve what that protein looks like uh, in a way that scientists in the lab hadn't been able to. Wow. So basically you're curing AIDS with video games. Is that yeah, congrats. Is that fair to say good job? Good job curing That's AIDS. Maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, but yeah, I mean it it is interesting. I mean it, it is Yeah, no no it no. Did no. Make I mean I'm kidding, but that actually yeah. is very, very cool. Yeah, it was a cool thing. That yeah, that's interesting. So so like uh, how did you get involved with this? Is there some? I mean, obviously you've been developing, you've been working on AAA games for a while until you started at the university relatively recently. How how did you like take your skills from AAA development and apply them to this? Yeah, it was really interesting. So I I mean I I got I got here just by I saw the job and I thought it looked interesting and I applied to it. I was working on Halo uh, at the time and I just kind of thought it would be cool to work on on stuff like this. And um, really, I think a lot of a lot of what I bring to the table here is just kind of knowledge of game development as it happens in the commercial world. There's a lot more emphasis on like testing and making things stable, making things. Uh, what? Making, Wait, in the real yeah. world, there's more emphasis on testing and stability. Yeah. Well, in academic uh. like in academic circles, software development isn't necessarily like practiced very much like like developing something that is people have to use on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis mm -hmm. and like keeping players happy and things like that like a lot of times the academic approach to like making something is like here I, I made it and then I did like a study and then I'm gonna write a paper about it or right and that's kind of it, it fulfilled its function right and it right, doesn't exactly. need yeah, to like, like I, to please a, a giant consumer base it just needed to answer the question so I could write the thing Right, exactly. So, like, oh, I, I invented this new algorithm that does this, and then you write a paper on it. But that's that's different than like putting the algorithm in something that people use every day, and and supporting them while they use it. So, like, Foldit mm -hmm. has like this player base that needs community management, right? And so, so we have a community manager here who's a lot like a community manager at like an MMO company who like handles communication and and tries to represent player concerns to us and things like that. That's all. That's all new to like the academic people here. So, how many people play Fold It? Um, a large number of people have played Fold It since its inception, but a lot of those people have just kind of checked it out and and they don't continue to play. But the number of people who have played Fold It in one form or another over the years it's been out is like close to five hundred thousand people. Wow. Oh, wow. And yeah. so if I'm listening to this podcast and I'm like, hey, that sounds cool. I want to help cure AIDS. Uh, how can <laughs> I go and play Foldit? Oh, they can go to the Foldit website, which is fold.it, and they can download it for free. And it's available on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Cool. Yeah. So really interesting. Have you considered adding like a story to Foldit? Like, like maybe there's like some <laughs> sort of an ongoing war that people can join, and they could join an organization <laughs> called maybe right. like Paragon or they can prepare the Paragon for Association wants you. To <laughs> they could, they could solve join that, proteins. and then they can they do have to earn victory in full. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, that just throwing that cool. out there there's... as an idea. Okay, thanks. No, we'll consider that. Cool. Well, actually, when you were saying that this is a game with like a thick learning curve and like people have to really get into it, I was thinking about like MOBAs. Like, this is the League of Legends <laughs> for the science community. I mean, it kind of gets into like it generates its own story over over time, anyway. Kind of like in a, I don't know, an esports kind of way, because it's mm -hmm. like the scientists will come back and say, "Hey, remember that time we ran this puzzle? Let's let's run it again, but with these different parameters because blah blah was interesting and." I, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's not the most compelling story to like the outside world. But when you are playing the game and an actual distinguished scientist in the field looks at your solution and says, oh, hey, that's a really cool solution. I never thought about like 
structuring the protein this way. That's a cool story, right? You get to see yeah, that's you, awesome. You like that's well, and that's real in a way that you know joining the joining the fight and preparing for victory isn't. So that's also very cool. <laughs> Victor yeah, will, so, yeah. So, are you only working on Folded, or it, are you guys working on other projects too? Uh, we have a we have a couple other games. Um, one of another one is called Nano Crafter, and Nano Crafter is a little bit like um, Casey's Contraptions. Have you ever oh, yeah. played that? Yeah, it's yeah. It's like you can build these sort of you can build these machines, except all the tools that you're given are actually based on real molecules, so that you could potentially build something in the game. And then we, this hasn't this hasn't happened yet, but our hope is that so somebody will design some crazy contraption in the game, and then that, that can actually be made in real life uh, in with using nanotechnology. So well, how come nobody's found a way to turn Candy Crush into a science game where you can cure cancer by crushing candy together? And, um, and- <laughs> <laughs> it's because because the problem that you solve when you play Candy Crush is actually not very scientifically interesting. You could you, you could write say. a bot that's, that plays Candy Crush that. very easily. I so I'm, you one. know I'm curious about the yeah. other work you talked about. How you guys have been studying how educational games work. I don't want to go down a whole educational path or whatever. But I've you know I used to teach um, a lot and have always been really interested in that kind of a thing. So when you talk about, like, I'm interested in the difference between uh, academic, like games that are designed to teach and the way that all games teach. Have you found anything about that? Like, are games actually more effective at teaching because they're designed to teach math or to teach science? They're made for the classroom. Does that actually make a game a better teacher? Yeah, it's really hard to say because there's so many, there's so many differing ideas about, like, what teaching actually means, right? For a mm-hmm. lot of people, it means kids do better on tests, on standardized tests. That's what, if you talk to like um, the principal of a school or something like that, that's what they'll be most interested in, is how do I raise the standardized test scores of my students? But if you talk to educational researchers and educational like pioneers, they might argue with that and say that like that doesn't actually necessarily mean the kids are learning just because they're doing better on tests. Like mm-hmm. what we really need to, to, and like we need kids to be excited about, about math and science and learning and, and ed- educating themselves. And we need kids to have conceptual understanding of what they're doing, not just like this rote procedural, oh, I carry the two and this is how I do long division. Like that doesn't matter as much as like actually having kids understand what, what the numbers actually mean and what they're doing when they do these things. So when you design games, you can design them for a few different um, end goals in mind. Like one kind of game might just teach the procedure. Like this is what you do when you do mm-hmm. long division. But another type of game might teach kind of the principles. Like um, this is why you would want to do long division. Mm-hmm. And then there's a, a bunch of ways you can design like the way the games, like are the, is the game open-ended? Like does, do, does it let kids kind of wander off the way they want to? Or is it very... Like, does it drill you on stuff? Does it make you have to answer the question? So there's a ton of, like, different approaches, different ways you can do it. So it's hard to say that, like, games are better. You, know, you can't just say, like, something. Right, right, right. It's sort yeah. of an impossible question. I, it, it's funny. Right. I remember, like, I so I just taught music, and I was always sort of off in the little arts department. But with the kind of hardcore real, real, real teachers, quote, real teachers that I worked with, they were so big on evaluation and on, like, finding out, how, like, basically testing the kids is basically what a test is right is trying to find out if the kid learned the thing that you tried to teach them and video games are super good at that because every you know every game you've ever played is a series of tests illustrating that you've learned everything up until this point right like you beat the level five boss because you learned all the tools you needed to beat the level four boss and then use them all together on that and when you beat the boss like you you beat the boss man like you can only do that if you mastered the skills so yeah, it, they seem like they're very good fundamentally at that, but I could see how it could be really hard to tell from one game to another how effective it is. Yeah, it's hard because, um, like, so the classic, like, educational games have been around for decades by now, right? Mm-hmm. And the class, the classic educational video game thing is you put, you, you sit a kid down in front of him, and the kid gets better and better at, at the game, and you're like, oh, man, the kid is really learning something, right? Then you give the kid a math test, like a real math test, like a regular math test, and they don't, they're not better at all because they can't apply what they've learned in the game to the test because the test is a, is portraying that 
problem in a slightly different way than the game mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. And so how do you solve that so that like people are learning the principles and not just like games are great at making you better at playing the game. But right. is there something more to that? Like, can you can you learn the principle of the thing from the game? I That's always found thing. that the games that taught me the most as a kid were the games that weren't educational and were instead like like RPGs full of text that mm-hmm. would teach me new words and stuff like that, or like point and click adventure games that would teach me how to solve puzzles in interesting ways and interact with people and read and whatnot. So uh, I always thought that was uh, uh, the the best approach, at least for me. Yeah, I, I mean, Oregon I, Trail was also one of my favorites growing there, up. I mean, there were a lot of people. I know I'm one of them who learned a ton of words from LucasArts games. I remember right, there are so yeah. many people who said, oh, I learned all these words and concepts from Monkey Island. And uh, I've actually more learned recently, I rock. learned a lot of history from Assassin's Creed, which is kind of maybe embarrassing to say. But like, <laughs> I know those games aren't accurate. But at the same time, even Assassin's Creed 3, <laughs> I like just <laughs> learned <laughs> some, some of know. what those guys looked like and wh- so where how things do you were. So if it's, if it's yeah. actually true? No, you go how look it know? up. I mean, you can go read the actual stories. Like, they have really good codexes in those games that sort of actually have the real history and say who's who and what happened where. And, you know, the, the in-game is a condensed version of whatever city you're in. But you still get a sense of, you know, Rome or London or Paris and, and where everything is. And it, it's actually really cool. I feel like I know those cities better and those time periods I- better. <laughs> I learned that in in uh, in Paris during the during the revolution, uh, French Revolution. Right, that's when Unity was sent. I yeah. learned that it was impossible to control anything. <laughs> yeah, it was impossible to climb a wall. I learned that Leonardo, <laughs> the, the, Leonardo da Vinci made a flying machine gun <laughs> device back in. Yeah, the, that back actually in worked. Way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so okay, so you guys ruined my segue before, but I was talking about Candy Crush because oh, some I see. interesting Candy Crush news happened this week. Uh, as I'm sure, you, as you guys both know, as listeners may or may not know, this week Activision announced that they were buying the makers of Candy Crush, King King dot com, I think is their official name. Uh, they're an Irish company. Um, Activision bought them for five point nine billion. Dollars, which is a hilarious number that sounds like Dr. Evil saying it. <laughs> uh, it's like a made-up imaginary number, uh, which uh, seemed to everyone... Well, just for context, that's uh, I think that's like $2 million more than what Disney paid for Lucas, so Star Wars and Indiana Jones, etc. And it's about four times more than Microsoft paid for... Oh, no, twice more. I think Microsoft paid $2.5 billion for Minecraft. So that's putting that in perspective. Yeah, I remember. Um, I, f- I feel like I remember when EA bought Playfish. Do you guys remember this? They bought Playfish oh, yeah. for three hundred million dollars because there was this Jesse Shell. That Jesse Shell like points for brushing your teeth. Talk. Did either of you guys see that talk? Do you know what I'm talking about? I I, I remember that. Yeah. Gamification. Yeah. So it was this. Yeah, it was kind of like pr- proto gamification talk, and he talked about that. And he was saying at the time, this was in, I think in two thousand and nine or two thousand and ten. He was like, "This changes everything." EA bought Playfish for three hundred million dollars, which at the time was this crazy idea that a major publisher would buy a casual game company for that much money. And now we've got Activision buying King for five point nine billion dollars, which is like five order of some magnitude or whatever more money. So, yeah, that's uh, a lot of yeah. money. Similar so, yeah, narrative. so there have been, obviously, there have been a lot of hot takes and analysis, uh, and a lot of people like poo pooing and saying, oh, this is a one hit wonder studio. Candy Crush is, is this game that's manipulative and it's losing revenue every month, every quarter. And uh, I, I saw one analysis that I will not name, but it made me, the, it was just like poo pooing on the deal and saying that Activision got over its head and made a mistake or whatever. And I, can't, I just kept thinking, like, here is a guy who brings in probably $50,000 a year writing a hot take about how Bobby Kotick is wrong for purchasing <laughs> this, making this $5.9 billion acquisition. And I don't know about you guys, and please chime in, but my sense, my kind of thinking on this stuff is always like, they they might be making dumb mistakes here, but like, there's no way we can analyze this until years after it happens, and we know what they were actually planning to do with this and what the ramifications will be. I think it's safe to say that Bobby Kotick has thought about it more than you have. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, that was, yeah, that's what I would say. say. Is like, that's I generally, right. right. I generally don't doubt Bobby Kotick. Like, that guy 
seems like he's pretty good at making money. He's mm. incredibly shrewd. I mean, it's funny because Activision has two really different reputations. One is like the Activision that the video game industry and like gamers know and like to like to kind of complain about, which is fine. I mean, I understand. I understand why, certainly. But then there's the Activision that people on Wall Street know, like as as the business and pretty much they can do no wrong like the wall street journal and all those other publications they love bobby kotick and they you know they love what activision's done because he's turned this fail basically it was this failing company uh in the in the late 80s and the early 90s and he's turned it into this massive massive company over the years and so he yeah he's he's very shrewd he he hasn't made a lot of very big mistakes or he knows how to like kind of turn the mistakes into things that uh, end up working out in the end. So it, I would say, you know, don't underestimate him. So here's the thing. So, yes, I, I'm, I agree with you. And I think that uh, in general, Bobby Kotick might know a thing or two more than the uh, the blogger <laughs> analyst who is uh, writing about how much he sucks. But um, But the question is, like, is this a bubble? Because we saw what happened to Zynga and Farmville and Facebook games, and we've seen what happened to all these MOBAs over the years that where companies like EA, and I don't know if Activision did it, but a lot of companies chase the MOBA bubble, uh, hoping to get rich like League of Legends did, and then they wound up having to cancel and shut down their games, and they turned out to be big failures. So with something like Candy Crush, is this... Uh, uh, is there a bubble here? What do you think, Matthew? Do you think that that they're walking into this too soon, or too, or too late, actually? Or uh, is this the right time to be buying a company like this? Well, I think um, so. So Bobby Kotick knows all of the products that that uh, King has in development right now. Like we mm-hmm. don't know what products King has in development right now, but mm-hmm. he knows. And I think part of the purchase price is based on like what he thinks the potential of those new things are. And I'm I'm absolutely certain that Kodak also knows like what kind of the major product products are in development at like Rovio or or you know Popcat like he kind of is aware of what these other places are also developing, and so he's probably Rovio's making... in trouble by the way. Rovio just had to fire a ton of people, hmm. uh, like some two hundred people I think. Uh recently a couple weeks ago so right yeah so like rovio or like zynga uh, rovio, or whatever. by the way is the people who make angry birds which so. is <laughs> for some reason they're still making an angry birds movie and even though it feels like angry birds it's like nobody cares yeah, about angry definitely birds. Sailed, like, like yeah. two years ago but yeah um, sorry what were you saying oh i was just gonna say like he you know as part of his due diligence he probably went to rovio and was like Hey, I'm Activision. I might buy you. Tell me everything that you have in development right now. And he, maybe he went to Zynga and did the same thing. And so he's able to compare all. The, you know, he has all this information about what products are in the pipeline, mm-hmm. and that could affect your decision. The other thing right, is like, like, yeah. Oh, so like you can't always know that like it's exactly going to be the same type of product that the company makes. So an interesting example of that is: Do you guys remember Red Octane? Oh, yeah. Octane used to make dance pads, and then they then they made uh, Guitar Hero right. uh, because of the the relationship that they had with like these manufacturers in China. They were able to like make these guitar plastic guitar peripherals, mm-hmm. and Activision bought them and got the Guitar Hero IP or whatever. And Guitar Hero itself kind of flamed out, but one of the things that they got when they bought Red Octane was this like core of expertise in like making plastic toys and stuff. And that actually came in really handy when they were developing Skylanders. Mm -hmm. And so Skylanders was another really big hit that came out of kind of the combination of their software development and their, the studios that they have along with buying red octane who know how to make like these plastic toys. So I think like maybe the way Kodak is thinking about it, isn't just like, Oh, candy crush and games exactly like candy crush, but he sees this like infrastructure, this like distribution infrastructure and these analytics and all this other stuff. And it's like, you might be able to use that kind of stuff for, for a very different product that other, you know, that people are not necessarily imagining right now. Also a massive audience. Yeah, exactly. A and people audience. like I, I'm. I don't. I haven't played enough Candy Crush to know this, but there's also the question of, uh, does Candy Crush have? I know there's like the Candy Crush guy, 
Does, do they have characters who you could imagine turning up and other things? Like, does it also <laughs> seem like buying the, buying you know all the IPs? I don't from the think game? so. Like, well, there's the red yeah. candy, which uh, they, there's. Has well, all no, I mean, there's death. like this guy though, right? He looks kind of like a like happy red haired guy who crushes the candy. I don't know. Maybe he's famous too. <laughs> and you could make the a candy <laughs> crush guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, the candy and, and when you see the candy crush guy, yeah, he's like uh, <laughs> there's no memorable it's like Kirk, it's like you and your your cultural touchstones, him and Warface are just like <laughs> I don't know if it, the, I'm the saying best. I don't know if it's a cultural touchstone. Maybe it's Oh maybe, man, that's it's Candy a, Crush guy. Oh yeah. Oh, he looked on oh. a t shirt now. <laughs> Kids will buy anything. I love candy that crush guy. guy. <laughs> Mickey Mouse, Yoda, Candy, candy Crush, crush guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um but yeah, well so so yes, I think we're all in agreement that like this is not the type of thing that that we really will understand until we know more. And I mean, yeah, the stocks all went up. The Activision stock went up immediately after the purchase. Um, clearly, the market trusts Kotick. Kotick, their uh, their faith is in Kotick. When you look yeah. at their look at their look at their stable of games at this point, I mean, it's absurd. When I look at how many, the fact that they own Blizzard, I think makes it is the thing that makes it absurd, but I mm-hmm. just look at how many different games Activision has control of, um, and it's it's ridiculous. So adding this to that, like adding a really humongous casual mobile game to that lineup seems, it, just looking at that stable of games seems like it makes sense on its face to me. Yeah, I think one of the reason for one of the reasons for the kind of knee jerk, like this sucks reaction, uh, especially in the games press, is that Candy Crush is a shitty manipulative game. Right. Um, that's like a clone of uh, what is it, Bejeweled, right? Yeah. Um, and it just like is designed to get you hooked and then get you to spend money in like the worst way possible, which is totally fair. But that doesn't mean it's a bad acquisition by Activision. Right. It might be evil. It might be an evil acquisition, but <laughs> financially. Yeah. Well, I don't. You know, Bobby Kotick's interest is not in like games as art or like doing favors for players, giving players what they want. I mean, he is just a businessman, and he has right. like wants to make money and grow his company and that's what he's he's done he seems very like very hollywood in that way like he seems kind of like those studio execs in hollywood who just don't really they're they're businessmen they're very good at making money and they know a good bet when they see one but they their expertise isn't in great films it's more about what is going to improve the bottom line yeah he's not really interested in like this game is going to be like amazing like a cultural touchstone kind of thing like you think about yeah. Kirk. it's more <laughs> like uh just yeah I'm, I'm making money and i'm growing my company mm-hmm. that's totally mm-hmm. good old Kodak. we should try to get him on the podcast oh that'd be great let's ask you should let's there's some funny do stories it. about him actually i heard that he just hates to like he won't do press because people just shout on him too much and like uh, he just doesn't care about the games press, and for for good reason. Yeah, I yeah, kind of can't blame there's him. There's no reason for him, right, to really talk to right to people. But as opposed to a company like EA or Ubisoft that often lets their executives talk to press at shows and E3 every year, um, just because they want like more. I mean, those companies. It seems like no company is able to get the type of major hits that Activision has with Call of Duty and all the Blizzard stuff, and now Destiny is uh, is. It's pretty big, pretty big old game called mm-hmm. Destiny. It's uh, medium. It's impossible medium. to have an episode of Kotaku Split Screen without mentioning Destiny. In yeah, some we had way. to get it in there. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the other thing that we wanted to talk about, okay, we're, on, we're running out of time here, but um, we should talk a little bit about Trails in the Sky. That was the other interesting thing that came out this week, um, was our story about the kind of development hell process that... Tr- Legends of Heroes Trails in the Sky SC second chapter went through uh, over the past four and a half years and just for some context Trails in the Sky is this excellent game for the PSP uh, <laughs> and PC it's like uh, what what are you laughing I'm at? I'm just I was waiting for you to say it. just for some context Trails in the Sky is the greatest JRPG ever made it's amazing if you haven't played it you know you're totally missing out Kirk I think we should talk some more about your behavior during raids <laughs> nice try <laughs> nice try I think we should talk guys we have to not die okay everyone we have to just not die anyway Trails in the Sky <laughs> is an excellent game uh, it ends on a horrible cliffhanger I'm mean, like a good cliffhanger but like tantalizing um, and 
back in 2011 when it came out, everyone expected the second chapter to come out within the near future. It did not. And I wrote this whole story that you can read on Kotaku about why, what took so long and the kind of hell that they went through localizing it. But I've always found localization in general to be a really interesting subject because I love games made in Japan, as do you guys, uh, at different, le- different levels. And it's always interesting to see which games come here, which games don't come here, what kind of goes into that decision, the whole process of localization. Um, Matthew, did you ever work in localization when you were working at any of those devs? Yeah, I did. Um, a lot of times it was it was the other way. It was like sending stuff off to be localized, but it definitely gave me a sense of like what localization is about and some of like the, the tricky parts of it and the pitfalls that can happen. It's not as simple as people think it is. I think, mm-hmm. you know, people are always like, oh, why don't you just translate? Why, why can't you just translate it and bring it over? And it's like, it's, a, it's actually more complicated than that. Yeah. So what do you think is the biggest misconception? Um, just that you, oh, that all you have to do is just translate the text and then it's done. It's like, there's, there's so much stuff that depends on the actual game that you have to know in order to, in order to make the translations make sense because of mm-hmm. the way different languages work. Um, so you have to know the context in which everything is being used. So, um, like a line that makes sense in one language, if you if you just translated it word for word, maybe it doesn't make sense at all. Um, so, something that I noticed, Jason, in your story about trails, I, I is was I think so. What was the story exactly? It was that there were all these terms from the first game mm-hmm. that then a different localizer changed some of them in the second game and so the original people had to go through and they were like no man you can't call this magic item that all of a sudden you can't use this slightly different word for it because it's called that that's what it was called in the first game you can't just call it something different so they had to go through and manually change everything like you have to know everything about the game you have to and be consistent with past games it seems like an absurd amount of work yeah, well, in that case, it wasn't that it was, like, intentionally doing it. It was more that it was very difficult, to because there's so many. And in Trails, every single NPC, so, like, every person in every town that you can talk to has their own name. So there are a lot of names, too. To right, but there are, I mean, there are a lot of games that are that deep that need to be localized, you know? Like, I would imagine that's, like, imagine localizing Fallout 4 or something in another language. It could be the same, it would be the same kind of challenges. Yeah. I would say, I don't know, I think this might be bigger than <laughs> most other games, including f- games like Fallout. That's true, the script was huge, right? How big did she say yeah. it was? Yeah, it's. Uh, I think the final count was like 760,000 <laughs> English words, which wow. is about 200,000 longer than War and Peace, just for context. I wonder how that many words it's, it's... you and I have written for Kotaku. Probably fewer than that. Probably, that's a lot of words. Um, yeah, that's a lot of words. That's like it's like ten novels. It's like it's uh, beyond belief. Like I think I was talking to Jess Chavez from Exceed who worked on the game, and she was saying that like she would copy it into a Google Doc, and the Google Doc would just crash. <laughs> <laughs> just because it can't handle. Wow. It. Sorry, yeah. this is too big. Too big. No, can't do it. Google's like fuck this. I'm out. Peace. Um, but yeah, localization I always found interesting, and anyone who's uh, who's interested can check out the story, uh, the Curse of Kaseki in Kotaku, um, and check out Trails in the Sky because it's so good. I think Matthew, you would like it uh, especially. Yeah, uh, I want to. I want to like play old. it. Yeah, it's really good. It's like Groundia or like Lunar, like old PS1 RPGs. It's very much a callback to those games. Yeah, totally. I, I will totally check it out, and it's better than War and Peace. Way so, better than War and better, Peace. Longer <laughs> anyway. So it's it's, it's 1.5 times better than War and Peace. Because a it's... lot more replayability. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, Matt, you you said you were playing... We were talking about this before, and you said you were playing Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, right? That's I know right. Kirk, yeah. Kirk is all about that game. Yes, yeah, I played that game, played that game quite a bit. So, yeah, I totally want to talk to you about it. Yeah, well, I haven't finished it yet. So I'm still, okay, I'm still so, so, wandering around. So we'll do. Well, all right. So I'll be kind of. Maybe we can do minor spoilers. What do you think of it? I guess. How far are you, and what do you think of it? Um, I am in on the third character. Okay. So I've done Jeremy and um, Wendy. I think. Her name okay, is. and so you're I'm on Frank now. Correctly. You're on. Correct. Yes. I'm yeah, on Frank. Frank's farm. Okay. 
Um, it, Can it, you explain what this game is? A yeah, bit? yeah, maybe a little back. You want to? You explain it, Matthew. I've, I've explained this game too many times. Okay. All right. So um, it's not clear who you play in this game, but you wander around uh, a very quaint English countryside town, and you can't really interact with much. You really just walk around, and then you kind of experience experience these flashbacks or memories of the characters uh, as the town was being sort of. Uh, attacked or you, we don't really know what happened but something that would that sort of I don't know evaporated all of the people in the town happened and, and so you kind of see these like flashbacks of people starting to panic about it and then like flashbacks about their lives and kind of tell, telling the story of these characters and what happened to them so it's yeah. this very it's like kind of um ethereal experience because there's no actual people and there's just memories and the and the music is really wonderful that it's also just like magisterial and and kind of um spiritual almost experience it's interesting i mean i so this game for a little context on how i played it i played it the first time and really liked it um i just thought it was you know i'm i'm i could complain about things in it but but generally i just i thought the whole vibe and the the feel of the game was very uh, distinct and very cool. So I got really into sort of tracing out who was who and what was going on because it's kind of hard to follow, right? Like I'm, I'm wondering if you're playing it for the first time, are you super clear on who's who and some of the flashbacks you're seeing, like what's going on? No, I'm not. I'm not. And, and in fact, it kind of, it kind of made a, a more negative impression on me when I first started it. Like the first mm -hmm. 15, 20 minutes were like, I was like, I'm not, I don't know who any of these people are. So I one, don't know why, you know, why they're arguing. I kind of don't care about these characters <laughs> yet. Do you have, so do you have subtitles turned on? Because that's a, that can help a lot actually. Like, yeah, if you turn I do. On, the first time I played it, I didn't. And I was like, oh my God, it's just like a bunch of British people talking. I have no idea who the hell, like halfway through, I was still not sure who was talking. And you can kind of figure it out, but with subtitles, it's much, much easier. So, Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, like as I started to play more and I started to learn more about the characters, I, I became much more drawn into the story. At first it was kind of like, I, you know, it, it seemed pretty uh, cold like mm -hmm. people just arguing with each other. Uh, the, one of the first things that you hear is about like something is attacking the village and it's like said in this very straightforward Bioshock audio diary kind of way. Mm -hmm. And then that was, that was like, didn't make the best first impression on me. But like when mm -hmm. I started wandering around and exploring things at my own pace and just kind of like looking at the town and, and watching, you know, figuring out more about what actually happened and figuring out more about these characters, then I really started to get drawn in and now I'm now I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, that was the thing. I wrote this hilariously huge article that like 20 people read that was like laying out the entire story. And that was what, for me, it was researching and writing that article was sort of what made me get really into the game is now when I play it, I know everything. I know everything that happened, who everyone is, how they all relate to each other. And it's actually fascinating how they've arranged this really complicated story out of order, but in a way that you can figure out. And also, I think the music, um, Jessica Curry, uh, who also directed the game, I think her music is really, really, really good. So, so yeah, when Kirk like says that 20 people read it, what he means is that it has 58,791 <laughs> Well, pages. by Kotaku standards, maybe it, it wasn't. Uh, considering how much time I put into it, I was like, well, this is going to be one of those articles that I spend a million years writing that isn't like a massive hit. But, but I'm It's happy a good with. thing that we write because we would like to serve our readers, not because we want to get traffic. <laughs> That's a good. We can wrap things up on a nice, on a nice positive message about about Kotaku. So Matthew Burns, thank you so much for being here. Is there anything that you would like to plug on the show, uh, other than your review of Sex, which people can read on Kotaku.com? That's right. You can read my review. Of <laughs> I can't even say it. <laughs> <laughs> this is ah, one of the best things we ran that month. I love that. Oh, my God. I can't believe sex. I wrote that. What I was I so thinking? I'm you wrote that. Oh, oh, God. You were thinking this, the process, this is the behind-the-scenes process of that article, was that you texted me and said, I could write a review of sex. And I said, you're doing it. <laughs> and then you wrote That's right. It. Well, I didn't expect you to say, like, actually do it. I, I expected you to be like, ha-ha, that's a funny idea. Now think of a real, like, article. That's how idea. Kotaku pitches work, is the thing that you think is a joke is actually the pitch that we'll take. Yeah, so, I guess so. Uh, so people can find you on Twitter, right? At, That's right. Um, uh, Mr. Wasteland. Yep. All, all one word, no underscores or anything. 
Okay, and, and that's, uh, uh, no periods because there's no periods there's in, no, on Twitter. There's no periods, of, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, um, Mr. Wasteland, uh, people can find you. Where else? What else um, do you want to tell people? You can also go to my site, which is magicalwasteland.com. All, all one word, all run together. And there is, there's like serious stuff on the site too. I don't just write things like reviews of, of sex. So if you want to read something that I <laughs> actually, I brain? actually believe, yeah. Like maybe if you want to read like things I really think about stuff, <laughs> go to my site. Uh, I'll um, say that I think your site is, is really good and people should go read it because there's lots of good stuff there. Yeah. It is, and people can also find uh, your Twine game, The Writer Will Do Something, which might be the most educational thing that anyone can can get, like if you want real insight into game development. You have to play that game. It's yeah, great. It, it is great. We sh- we'll link that in the post. Uh, which you co-wrote with Tom Bissell, who will get mad if we don't mention him. Right? That's right. right. No, he doesn't, he doesn't. He's very gracious about that. Yeah, but I yes. know. Tom, I was just emailing with Tom um, about Grantland. Rest in peace, Grantland. Uh, the site that closed, Bill Simmons' site that closed, that Tom that, used to write for. Yeah, that he used to write for. And he sent me a picture of his child, who is adorable. Um, so with Grantland might die, but at least Tom has an adorable kid. Uh, <laughs> That's from, true. From death, That's from death nice comes That's the nice silver lining. <laughs> <laughs> Not that Tom hasn't written for there for like two years, so it's irrelevant. To I think Grantland anything. had to die so Tom's child could live. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's probably the truth of it. Um, I, I do wish, I wish there was like a video game website that was like Grantland because that feels like a, a huge hole that's been saying. Like you get a lot of, there's like sites that are very much like all about corporate news. Um, and then there are like super... Uh, uh, dense critical spheres where with like blogs that are like all in depth reviews of Dragon Age 2 um, but it doesn't feel like there's anything really straddling that middle ground in a way that Grantland did in a, in a really good way for video games sadly I wish that happened someone if you're listening to this and you have the means uh, you, should, you should start a website that's Grantland for video games that's your elevator pitch Grantland for video games yeah hire a ton of <laughs> Ton of, ton Maybe of that's not the best game. elevator pitch right now for a no. site that like just got <laughs> shut down. That just got, yeah, yeah. A site that failed. Um, I guess we have to make Kotaku more like Grantland. That's that's the goal. Yeah, um, maybe that's that's the short term answer. If only we had a layout as good as Grantland's. Uh, mm. I got so I put up a little post on our site earlier this week about split screen, and a bunch of the comments were people like, "Oh, I had no idea this is a thing," and it, it's like, "Wait a minute! If you're reading Kotaku." regularly how have you not seen the past six posts about split screen and it occurred to me that like (laughs) that we have a problem where like everything just keeps falling on the site because of the way that our site is structured new posts pop up every half hour or so sometimes more frequently and like you lose stuff and it's really unfortunate i wish there was a better way for us to like promote stuff on the site our best articles and whatnot um, yeah, at the very least, people can subscribe. They can subscribe to our podcast, right? Yeah, you can give the yeah, plug yeah, there, yeah. which so, you should definitely okay, so do yeah, if you like so, this and you're listening. Yeah, if you are listening, if you've made it this far, um, please subscribe to us on iTunes or RSS. And uh, if you are listening on iTunes please, and you enjoy it, please leave a rating because apparently we need more of those. Uh, yes. Last I checked, we had like uh, 12, 11, 12, something like that. They're which positive, is which is nice. Uh, I read somewhere, someone sent me a link to, like, a fake review generating site, which might be how all these other podcasts have, like, hundreds or thousands of I think reviews, the other podcasts are also just really popular. <laughs> we're, we're really, we were, in like, number four on the games and hobbies. Uh, yeah, but we already know we can't games. tell what the hell that even means, so. Right. Nobody knows what any of that means. Um, I think we're really popular, so thank you, everybody, for making us really popular. Um you can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on Gotaku. Uh, Matthew Burns, Mr. Mr. Wasteland on Twitter. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening to Episode 7. Goodbye. Goodbye, dear folks. Goodbye. Bye.